Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I think it's about time to begin our conference and hopefully whoever has not uh, joined yet will do so uh, in the nearest few minutes. Uh, but not to take uh, the time of those who are very punctual and uh, joined here on time. Uh, I think uh, we need to respect that and uh, go on with uh, our planned uh, event. Uh, so, uh, first of all, let me uh, say that it is our pleasure to host uh, you today at the uh, International Conference entitled uh, Inclusive Rural Development, Empirical Evidence from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this conference has an international dimension thanks to you all, our dear par participants, uh, who represent uh, various uh, research institutions uh, from several European countries, both European Union and those uh, uh, neighboring ones. Uh, first of all, it is my personal honor uh, to be able to open this event uh, on behalf of the conference's uh, organizing committee uh, and our uh, institute. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. Um, my name is Vitaly Krupin uh, of the Institute of Rural and Agriculture Development of uh, Polish Academy of Sciences uh, located in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, our institute uh, this year celebrates its 50th anniversary uh, of being an interdisciplinary research entity devoted to issues uh, of rural agricultural development, uh, utilizing simultaneously uh, economic, social, demographic, spatial, geographic, and other approaches. Also, one of the key uh, co-organizing partners, uh, thanks to whom uh, the organization of this conference was possible, uh, is the State Institution, uh, Institute of, for Economics and Forecasting uh, of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, uh, represented today by three researchers from uh, the Department of Economics and Policy of Agrarian Reforms, led by Professor Olena Borodina, uh, with this institute, we have a long-standing and fruitful cooperation uh, over seven years, uh, conducting joint research projects, uh, supporting each other uh, in researchers' mobility. This institute is located in Kyiv, Ukraine, and um, we are very thankful for uh, supporting this conference uh, uh, today. Uh, another key partner of today's conference is the uh, European uh, Rural Development Network, ERDN, uh, which since 2002 supports uh, cooperation between uh, uh, researchers in Europe. And we thank the participants from Lithuania, Moldova and Romania for uh, answering uh, our call and uh, willing to present their findings today. Uh, we would like also to thank uh, Professor Pavel Chmielinski for coordinating this cooperation. Uh, on behalf of the R ERDN and the continuous and multiple uh, efforts to support the knowledge uh, uh, dissemination between the ERDN partners. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is the inclusive rural development. Uh, it is aimed at achievement of balanced uh, development in rural areas in which uh, the availability of uh, mm, public goods would not only be uh, limited to particular um, areas, but also would be uh, available and uh, the quality and the availability and quality and the development of uh, uh, all this infrastructure, the social and economic uh, uh, issues would be uh, available not uh, just in some areas, but uh, all over across the uh, country, all the European countries. Uh, and uh, what's most important also, so that uh, no uh, social groups would be excluded from access to uh, these public goods. So inclusive rural development can be treated in numerous ways, but the key point here is uh, the making uh, the accessibility of uh, the public goods uh, to all and uh, thus uh, increasing the uh, overall welfare. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to start uh, our conference uh, and ask the presenters to share their findings on the topic. Uh, each presentation is uh, given a time slot of up to 20 minutes. 
And please note that uh, the time devoted to questions and remarks to all presentations uh, will be given uh, in the final part of the conference, uh, but you're welcome to write them in the chat and we will try our best to have them discussed uh, during the designated time slot at, at the final stage. And uh, now I would like to ask our first team of presenters from Lithuanian Center for Social Sciences from Institute of Economics and Rural Development, uh, Dr. Zivile Gedminaite Raudone and Rita Lankauskiene, uh, who will present uh, um, a topic entitled Innovative Stakeholder Driven Model for Shaping Rural Policy, the Experience of Lithuania. If I could ask you to share your screen and we could go on with the presentations. Okay, hello. Hello, everybody. Very nice to be here uh, in this conference. And we are very pleased that we will have a chance uh, to be the first presenters and to share our experiences of Lithuania and how we are do dealing here with inclusive rural development and what are the current trends. So I will share my slide presentation. Mm. Okay, please confirm that you can see it. Yes, thank you. Okay, so maybe I will start. And uh, yes, we are here together, me and my colleagues. And just uh, for you just to, to know that we are now new institute, the Lithuanian Center for Social Sciences, and the previous was uh, Institute of Agrarian Economics. Okay, so... My presentation today, uh, it will be about the emerging teams for inclusive rural development in Lithuania, what we have found you know, from the current research. Then I want to talk about the programming period of rural development plan for Lithuania for the coming seven years, how we are dealing with this and how we include these topics into this. And uh, the new findings I want to, uh, to tell you how we as a researchers and by participating in Sherpa project, what the input we can give to the Lithuania itself and uh, as a whole project to the Europe itself, uh, when we are planning uh, not only sustainable, but also inclusive rural development. And of course, uh, the results of what we have found in the last two years and the concluding remarks. So the current uh, problems and the challenges and teams for inclusive rural development in Lithuania uh, are the following. First of all, is demographic shift. We are facing the population and aging. And I think that it's not only the trend in Lithuania, but also in others, that the people are still moving out of the rural areas and we have more aged people of course, uh, we, are, we have new trend that uh, people from cities are moving to rural areas, but still this move, movement is not uh, large enough that would say that it's very positive aspect. So we still are talking about depopulation and aging. And this main problem is facing the second point, uh, infrastructure and basic services. As the number of inhabitants are decreasing, we need to think what kind of infrastructure we need to provide for these people in the rural areas, talking about schools, about kindergartens, about, um, about hospitals, and about uh, uh, commuting to work, who should be responsible for this, the buses or some, you know, um, car sharing ideas. So is, this is very important also the infrastructure and uh, basic services. Another thing is what is important, diversification of rural economy. Uh, if the farmers are getting, uh, and the farms are getting larger, this means that, you know, the remaining population of rural areas, they need to find the new role in this. And also if we have some uh, negative aspects of the, of the farming, we need to diversify. And this, the trend is also important when we talk about uh, inclusive de rural development. Another aspect, what we highlighted in the recent research, uh, the competencies of inhabitants, not only elderly people, 
not only farmers and rural communities, but also officers of public administrations who are creating uh, the rules for the new rural policy, how we should develop our, you know, um, uh, policy for rural development and agriculture itself. So we face also this problem in Lithuania. Another thing, but uh, we think that we stuck for some, you know, good uh, proposals and solutions is low intention of rural inhabitants for integration, cooperation and co-creation. And I think that this element or aspect, it was, you know, of the past experience of Lithuanian being in the Soviet Union, when, you know, the people were forced for the cooperation let's say, and it, until now, they are very, you know, like conscious when we talk about uh, integration and cooperation and they're still thinking, you know, like what the risk it should be, why I need to share, why not to share. And still, you know, when you want to push, you also have some resistance of this. Uh, another aspect is lack of motivation, lack of so self-confidence. And from our last, you know, meetings and discussions, what this means that the people, uh, they have a good ideas, they had a good uh, motivation to do, but they still don't feel confidence if it's good way to do, if not too risky, you know, somebody needs, you know, to, to prove that they're on the good way, or just they want to see more good or best examples, you know, that is going well. And the last is decision-making process for rural regions in Lithuania. We are discussing, you know, if decision-making process should go top-down or bottom-up approach, which is the best, you know, that uh, we would hear every voice that needs to say and to be heard, you know, for the, for the future or for the new decisions. So that's how we live now and what the problems we have. And now I will uh, say how we are dealing with the new policy process in the coming years and uh, when we talk about inclusive rural development in Lithuania. So uh, now at the current stage in the last uh, two years, we, ha we have uh, a new rural development plan for the coming seven years. And uh, our institute was also involved in this. Uh, we been doing a big job for the Ministry of Agriculture when we were assessing economic, social and environmental situation. And here you can see that what uh, work was done by the Institute, by the Ministry and by the other institutions and organizations. We were discussing about the interventions of CAP, what the new measures and old measures should be, what the indicators and values. And that's the process is still going on. We don't have the confirmed. And now I want to tell how our institute, you know, gave a good value for this process uh, by being a member uh, and um, in the Sherpa project. So the Sherpa project itself, it's uh, the project financed by Horizon 2020 and four years project. And we are very pleased to be part of this as ERDN is a member of this, um, of this project team. And the main focus is of this project formulation of recommendations for future policies in the rural air for the rural areas and agriculture itself. So first of all, uh, it works on the future research policies in this area then uh, it supports the implementation of policies relevant to rural areas in the coming programming period. And of course, it discusses the direction of rural policy in the next programming period, how we should work in the 10, 15 years. Okay, so the aim you can see very shortly uh, how we need to achieve the same. So to analyze the main drivers of future trends of rural areas, then what is very innovative, establishment of multi-actor platforms that uh, uh, involve actors or members from the science, society, and policy. And then uh, the results of these uh, platforms create uh, a shared knowledge base for the rural policy. And uh, then we can share the past and ongoing research project and everybody is free to, to use and to get this information. And by having this platform, we can engage a dialogue between citizens, researchers, and policymakers. And of course, for formulate recommendations, how the 
uh, rural policy should be shaped in the future because only research and discussions from all these part of participants you know are very essential and important so in lithuania i will go now uh, down for the lithuanian case and we'll tell about our map, how we are dealing and how we work and give our input for the inclusive rural development. So in Lithuania, we have the map that covers the whole territory of Lithuania. And it was newly established platform and our institute is a coordinator of this map. And we decided to talk about three broad topic, agro-innovation, agro-food technologies, inclusive and creative society and energy and sustainable environment. So here you can see that our map like covers very broad, you know, community of Lithuanian, including civil society as a consumers of rural areas, NGOs, business organizations, farmer organizations, who are those who are creating the value for this. And of course, science research institute and university, innovation agencies, and public organization as central government as chamber of agriculture. So in total, we have 15 experts. And the, the, in the last slide, I want to show very shortly about the process, how we work in this. Then the first, we have discussion paper on some specific topic for the rural areas. Then it, in each country, we are working in this, uh, in this platform and the writing position paper for the Lithuanian, for Poland, for any other EU country. And then we, how we work and uh, on, on some specific topics for the whole Europe. Okay, so how much time I still have, 10 minutes. So, <laughs> so uh, I have talked before about the challenges and opportunities in Lithuania. So in the last uh, year, you know, we have pointed out that we need to discuss with our expert in this uh, map, in this platform, about the coming uh, challenges, demographic shift and uh, climate change, environmental services, change in production and diversification, as I told, about the infrastructure and basic services, about digitization and smart ruralities as a solution for these challenges, and about inequalities and well-being in rural areas. And here you can see the results very shortly uh, that, you know, what are the challenges, how the experts see the challenges and how they support it. So the demographic shift, the population and aging are the largest, the biggest challenge. Then the second in the line is competences of inhabitants. As I told that, you know, we need to update and, uh, you know, to adapt these competences to the current trends, to the current market. And infrastructure and basic services are in the top three. And then you can see the diversification of rural economy, lack of motivation, weak strategic planning, and low intentions of rural inhabitants for the integration. Uh, later on, we have discussed about the opportunities, how we can overcome these challenges, and uh, how we can start in the coming programming period where should focus. Uh, the most. So everybody has agreed that opportunities proposed by the Green Deal are on the top. And uh, following the Green Deal, we can find uh, you know, the solutions for all the other alternatives. So for Lithuania, we think, and uh, this is also with the pandemic situation, that local food and tourism development also is one of the opportunities for Lithuanian rural areas, especially if we want to have inclusive development of rural areas. And then uh, opportunities are human resources because we still have a good motivated people. And as I said, we still have people who move from the cities to rural, rural, to, um, rural areas with good ideas how to develop some activities and they are also good, you know, members who becomes uh, part of the communities in Lithuania. Then potential of digitization, as we have a good internet uh, uh, connection in, in all uh, territory of Lithuania. So rural areas can also use this and including uh, work remotely, not only in cities. 
Then in the opportunity in Lithuania, we see strong urban rural re relations. And not only when we talk about the local food and tourism development, but also about uh, more intensive uh, uh, possibilities to work remotely. So these relations are quite strong and uh, we see as an opportunity. And the COVID-19 pandemic situation is also was mentioned by the expert that, you know, it also can give some, you know, insights and new uh, possibilities for rural areas in the future. So the vision, what uh, we agreed and what we proposed for the Lithuanian, that rural areas up to 2040 are rural regions with more than villages in a partnership as an attractive place to live and work. So everybody can uh, see the role in the rural area. And we think that if this vision, you know, would uh, become true by the 2040, then inclusive rural development, you know, will cover all the peoples, all the activities. And it's not only rural areas for those who, who were thinking about only agriculture, but attractive place to live with good infrastructure and in the partnership, uh, willing to work, co-create together, and you know, just what we are discussing currently, what the rural, new face of rural area should be. So here, just uh, with the results uh, that rural areas in Lithuania with desirable infrastructure, with a gap focused education and continuous improvement for all professions, with regional specialization, with developed local food networks, and with implemented smart specialization strategy. This is the vision and the key uh, elements for the new rural development program for Lithuania. And uh, uh, what the tools can help to reach this vision, uh, what was talked before, that we can use existing network between rural and urban actors, existing partnership and cooperation before between different policy levels, that we can use a local knowledge and small scale data that are very important and applying this bottom up approach. We can use interconnectedness between policies on national and local level and it's very important. And we need to use national policy framework enable place based strategies bottom up approach. And we need to increase trust between authorities and society. And of course, to strengthen existing networks of local actors. So I think these elements were mentioned and highlighted that we want, if we want to reach rural vision of Lithuania. Okay, that was from our side. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you want to get more information about the methodology of Sherpa or about the results, so you can just go into the website ruralinterfaces.eu. And there are a lot of new information for about the research, about the ongoing projects, so on. So it's, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, if I could remind uh, our participants that if you have any questions or comments, uh, you're welcome to write them in the chat and we will uh, go back to them uh, at the end, maybe not end, but at the final stage of uh, our conference. So uh, nothing should be missed. Uh, and uh, now I would like to ask our next presenter, uh, Dr. Viktor Yarovay. Uh, from the Institute of Economics and Forecasting of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, uh, who will present us with a, a topic on local inclusive development of rural areas in Ukraine, economic potential and problems. Uh, please, doc, Dr. Victor. Uh, I'm representing the Department of uh, Economics uh, economics and policy uh, of agrarian transformation at the Institute of Economics uh, and uh, uh, forecasting uh, Ukrainian National Academy of Science. Our department uh, um, focuses mainly on rural development and inclusive uh, uh, 
rural development is our focus uh, for the number of uh, years, maybe the last uh, decade, it's our main focus. Uh, we have done a number of uh, research projects and uh, what I'm trying doing now uh, in this presentation, uh, definitely I cannot uh, show you all our uh, achievements and results, but maybe I can just provide you a quick and brief uh, snapshot of uh, the situation in Ukraine uh, with rural development, rural inclusive development. And uh, what is the main point uh, for us now that when we are starting talking about rural development, what we mean? Um, the point is that uh, we have a significant change in Ukraine during the last uh, five years. And um, practically um, early and now um, the state rural policy was uh, not very uh, good um, um, articulated. Uh, at the different levels of uh, you know, state authorities. Uh, it means that um, usually uh, all ministries and government focused on agricultural development, but not on rural development. And last five years, we have a reform of decentralization. That means that uh, the power to uh, make decision is moved uh, from the um, central national level to the uh, local level, to the lo level of local authorities. And it was the main purpose of this reform to provide a local communities with more power to um, manage the uh, local development. And um, as a result of this um, reform, uh, we moved from uh, about 10,000 of uh, former uh, rural self-governments to the 1,000 and half new territorial communes uh, that are both um, urban and uh, rural. Usually so-called urban uh, communities uh, include many uh, periphery rural areas and um, the point is that now uh, the problem of local rural uh, inclusive development is the uh, main purpose of this local authorities. And uh, what I want to say, the first point is that uh, all those uh, communities have a very different uh, potential uh, to provide this um, economic development. They have very different uh, resources, they have very different sizes, populations and um, uh, possibilities uh, to uh, provide economic activities. Uh, just uh, on this slide, you can see that uh, sizes, land area of those communities are uh, very different. Uh, the same is with uh, population. Uh, so um, practically land area and uh, population are the main factors of uh, factors of uh, local economic development. And they different, uh, differ at significant stage. And um, um, on this slide, you can see uh, land area per uh, capita at the uh, communities. And um, you can see, um, for example, the Mm, smallest uh, our community is only uh, two and a half square kilometers and the largest is uh, uh, two uh, thousand and half uh, uh, square kilometers and uh, the same is with population the communities are very different differentiated 
and it means that um, uh, they have very different potential. And uh, uh, here you can see that practically um, smaller, uh, smallest communities are concentrated mainly in uh, Western region and uh, they have uh, um, smaller potential. Um, on this map, you can see uh, the state approach uh, to um, equal for equalization, uh, the possibilities of community to uh, provide the economic development. Uh, the point is that um, uh, community, communities get a different uh, incomes from uh, taxes, from state uh, support, and um, in red color here uh, represented the communities which uh, get state support because uh, they are not so strong uh, to be self-sufficient. And in green color are the communities that um, are stronger and uh, their economic potential are stronger. It means that have to pay an additional uh, subvention, reverse subvention uh, to the state budget. And uh, this uh, amount is used uh, to provide uh, uh, a community with uh, less potential, with additional uh, fin financial resources to provide uh, the economic development. Um, the next point I want to emphasize is that uh, state financial support is not practically oriented on exactly on uh, economic support. Uh, what I mean that uh, if you can see on the main uh, uh, state subvention and donation grants uh, to the uh, local authorities, you can see that uh, the biggest share is um, the support for education, medicines, uh, roads, etc. Uh, but practically only on the first place is a uh, basic subvention, which uh, is not um, oriented for exactly uh, defined uh, direction how uh, the communities can to use it. And it could be used for some uh, economic projects uh, and uh, um, some direction that uh, uh, could be um, understood as something to help uh, economic development, not uh, infrastructural, but economic. And uh, what does it mean that uh, practically um, for the local communities, uh, very important point is uh, to be oriented on their local uh, resources uh, to help themselves and uh, uh, to provide exactly uh, such economic uh, development uh, which they need. Uh, here on the map, uh, you can see uh, also that um, by uh, taxes that uh, communities accumulated uh, on their um, territory, uh, they are also very differentiated and uh, practically, um, again, uh, some depressive uh, region are concentrated in the west part of Ukraine. That means that uh, those communities are not so strong Uh, when we talk about local uh, resources, one of the most uh, important uh, source uh, for economic development from local resources is uh, local uh, taxes. Uh, 
which uh, communities generate uh, and accumulate from uh, property and uh, from different uh, economic activities in the territory, so-called flat, flat tax. Uh, it's a tax from um, individual, individual uh, entrepreneurs and uh, uh, also agricultural um, enterprises, farmers, small farmers. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, usually um, the, the share of this uh, local taxes is not uh, very high. Uh, in average, it's um, about 16% in Ukraine. But there are some communities that um, are economically strong enough to uh, get more than 40% of local taxes, 40% uh, from their uh, budget revenues. Uh, we can try also um, to see how uh, local communities spend uh, uh, their money, their possible uh, financial resources and uh, discover on the example of a number uh, communities uh, that uh, practically their expenses are not oriented on uh, long-term economic development. Um, Practically, those directions are represented by green color in the upper right corner of uh, those pictures. And the similar situation is um, very obvious for many, many rural communities in Ukraine and is the result uh, of uh, many uh, reasons. First of all, uh, their budgets are not uh, enough uh, strong to uh, provide all um, necessary uh, direction uh, to finance. And uh, from other uh, side, um, local communities are not very effective in uh, defining uh, their strategic goals and uh, expenses. Uh, for example, on this map, you can see that uh, um, the share of such administrative expenditures is uh, very high in many communities and is more than uh, 30%, for example. Uh, it's clear that uh, practically for um, social development, for economic development, uh, they have not enough uh, financial resources. Uh, <clears throat> the, main, uh, uh, the main resource for local communities uh, to um, provide economic development now is uh, land. And uh, I have to mention that uh, during uh, last years, we have uh, significant changes in land relation in Ukraine. We have uh, land reform to continue. And uh, this year we launched uh, a land market. And it means that um, it is allowed now to buy and sell agricultural land for individuals and in several years it would be possible also to buy uh, communal land and state land uh, and um, just now uh, new communities uh, are in the process of obtaining uh, in communal ownership uh, the state the state land and this land could be a very significant uh, resource for the economic development, but um, it is pity that um, in fact our analysis show it uh, 
uh, that uh, practically uh, there are many, many problems uh, for communities uh, to use uh, their own land. Um, first of all, uh, the land they have uh, from the state, just now I mean agricultural land, usually uh, there are a long-term lease agreement on this land, uh, and uh, this land is operating by uh, large uh, our holdings, and agreements are for uh, 20, 30, 40, uh, up to 50 years, and it means that during this period, practically, um, community can get only uh, some lease payment from this land, but cannot change uh, the direction uh, how to use this land, maybe for some, um, to stimulate local family farming or to create some uh, communal enterprises. Um, so practically it means that uh, even in case uh, when a community have uh, significant local resources, the access uh, to these resources in terms of defining how to use it is uh, very, very limited. And it is a main point uh, about inclusiveness because uh, uh, they have resources, but they cannot benefit uh, from uh, those resources in economical sense. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how many, how much time I have. Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. Um, Another our uh, analysis uh, also shows that uh, it is strange, but in many cases, uh, more rural uh, communities, I mentioned that they are practically mixed, uh, that uh, there are uh, urban population and uh, urban settlement and rural settlements. And uh, they uh, define it by themselves how to use their uh, funding. And uh, the, our analysis shows that in many cases, more rural is um, community in terms of uh, rural areas they have. Uh, usually they prefer to spend their funding uh, for the urban center. Um, it means again that uh, from the point of uh, inclusiveness for uh, rural areas, there are significant problems uh, there. Uh, so just to uh, generalize, the main problems of inclusive rural development in Ukraine uh, for rural areas are that uh, uh, very strong uh, differenti differentiation uh, by uh, local potential for economic development. And uh, it means that uh, some state policy uh, is needed that um, take into account this differentiation. Uh, but at the moment, we even uh, have not clear general uh, state policy for rural inclusive development. Only uh, very often uh, it is mentioned that rural development um, is a part of national programs, but in practice, uh, again, it means very often uh, not exactly the inclusive rural developments in terms of support of uh, rural periphery of these local communities. Um, and from other side, uh, so we have not a uh, clear vision of uh, at the national level, uh, but at the same point, uh, local communities that have now uh, power to decide how to develop uh, uh, the areas, uh, they usually not uh, um, are oriented in their thinking on uh, inclusive rural development. Uh, 
and uh, it is a very um, significant problem and uh, um, okay thank you for your attention so thank you very much for this presentation uh, if I may point out that there are several questions in the chat uh, in regard to your uh, findings and we will come back to them in the final stage of our conference, but you may already uh, look at them and uh, prepare your answers. Uh, now uh, I would like to um, continue and the next presentation uh, entitled Rural Development Monitoring, a tool for analyzing socioeconomic changes in Poland. Uh, will be presented by uh, our colleague, Łukasz Komorowski. It's, uh, these results were uh, generated by a larger team of researchers, but uh, today Łukasz uh, was able to join us and uh, let us know what the findings are. Please, Łukasz. Uh, okay, thank you, Witek. Uh, can you see my full screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Vitek, and the whole team of the conference for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, our project rural development monitoring uh, in the context of a tool for analyze, observe socioeconomic changes in uh, Poland. Uh, we think it's very important to observe some processes to get to, to find some areas uh, in the context of inclusive rural development. Um, this is a joint presentation with uh, Professor Monika Stanny, but unfortunately she cannot be with us uh, today. So I will try to, to speak on behalf of our uh, team. And uh, I will start from the beginning some uh, general information. Uh, the debate on rural policy reveals duality of approaches to rural development and first of all there is the still dominant approach that which considers rural areas in opposition to urban areas and it uh, it is very clear you can clearly see it in Poland where uh, rural area are area outside uh, cities and this is administrative administrative division and some offers things that uh, concentrating uh, this approach lets, leads to wrong policies to level out the disproportions rather than the help adjust to the diversity of rural areas. And in ICD countries uh, are increasingly often uh, adopting a holistic approach to rural development, focusing on new, new approach well-being in its many aspects, it's quite new. Uh, quite new uh, approach and uh, OECD published uh, two years ago principles on rural policy uh, and uh, they point out that territorially oriented policies should be based on solid evidence and data on an appropriate scale and this presentation is about the proposal of such uh, research um, as you can see in one of several recommendations on rural policy making, the OECD recommends foster monitoring, independent evaluation and accountability of policy outcomes in rural areas. Through policy evaluation, development of outcome indicators, providing comparable data collected in an innovative and simple way. And as Professor Monika Stanley pointed out in interview with OECD representative, the implementation of uh, this recommendation can help us to understand what works, what doesn't work, what to focus on to improve rural policies and where to target support in line with the place-based policy. Another uh, new, maybe not a new approach to, to creating uh, rural policies. Mm, and uh, since 2010, uh, a cyclical rural development project uh, is, has been carried out jointly by our institute, Institute of Rural and Agricultural Development of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and the 
European Fund for the Development of Polish Countryside Foundation. And the research team consists uh, leader, Professor Monika Stanley, Professor Andrzej Rosner, and uh, more recently, Agata Mruz and uh, myself. Um, and so far, uh, the result of three stages uh, have been published. Uh, and the fourth stage is in progress. And general in the study, we determine the level of socio-economic development of rural areas in Poland and the structure of this development by providing typology of rural areas. Uh, what is very important, the research is conducted at municipality level. Uh, I mean local administrative units in the EU nomenclature. Uh, data are obtained from several institutions and half of the indicators are not officially published by them. So it's uh, very important too. And at each stage of the project, the questionnaire is also carried out, which is completed by all rural and uh, urban rural municipalities in Poland. And this is over 2,100 units. Mm, and uh, I would like to add uh, that the results of this study have been made available to the OECD as important material in uh, report Rural Policy Review Poland uh, 2018. Mm. In the study, we define uh, socio-economic development, uh, as you can see, as the process of transforming rural areas into in habitat friendly environment, in other words, one which allows them, those people to fulfill their needs and aspirations, uh, labor conditions and obtaining satisfactory income, uh, access to public services and defined cultural goods, a sense of participation in the life of the local community and the sense of agents in the ongoing transformation, etc. And the study is distinguished by a set of diagnostic features that were the basis for constructing 47 empirical indicators using 11 components. Uh, those components you can see on the screen from spatial accessibility to living conditions. And uh, those components are grouped into four spheres, speciality, economy, society, and life. Uh, quality. Mm. Some, uh, some words about uh, methodology of, of the project. Uh, all the empirical indicators uh, underwent a statistical normalization uh, according to the unitarization method, and they were made comparable in the range from zero to uh, one. Mm. Next stage is calculating the synthetic value of uh, given 11 components. Uh, the empirical indicators were weighted. Uh, next, the synthetic indicators of the 11 components served as the basis for non hierarchical grouping of the municipalities with the aim of forming homogeneous uh, types by similarity of features. And we, we, we use uh, gravity model proposed by Edwin Diday which is called dynamic uh, clouds clustering. Uh, and uh, in most general terms, this method let us uh, group these gminas, municipalities into clusters that are most similar internally, but uh, in the same time, this, in the same time, they are, they are most different from each, uh, from each other. Mm. Yeah, and uh, result of uh, applied procedure uh, I, I showed you is identified seven types of rural development. And uh, you can see on the screen the map uh, with those seven types. Uh, type one dominance of traditional agriculture is uh, green, but uh, dark green, mostly lies in the uh, east part of the Poland. Type 2, light green, dominance of large-scale agriculture, mostly lies in the uh, eastern and northern part of the Poland. Type 3, blue, 
prevalence of the agricultural function, type four violet multi-income fragmented agricultural structure, uh, mostly lies uh, in the south east part of the Poland, yellow type five multifunctional with balanced sectors of the economy, and type six and seven orange and uh, dark red, urbanized and highly urbanized with uh, reduced agricultural function. Uh, and thanks to use of this crop myth, uh, we know the internal structure of the, those types in the context of 11 components. So as you can see on the table uh, below, um, we can uh, read some information from this uh, plus and minus uh, signs. Uh, for example, in type seven, highly urbanized, we know that uh, all of those components are evaluated relative uh, good, but uh, agricultural sector is evaluated uh, relative uh, bad because of uh, the reduced function of agriculture in, this, uh, in these areas. And as you can see, those urbanized areas lies mostly outside of big cities, uh, regional capital cities. So it's, uh, we can explain uh, this uh, disappearing of agricultural sector because of development of other uh, functions. Mm. And uh, I will not discuss uh, these uh, types uh, in detail now because, because it should be emphasized that, uh, but uh, should be emphasized that green types from one to three are characterized by a high share of agriculture in the local economy. And we call them relatively monofunctional types uh, because other sectors of the economy are poorly developed in them. But orange types five, six, seven are multifunctional because the non-agricultural sector is the most important uh, there. Mm, and study using this method is very useful because uh, it does not uh, tell us where the indicators are low and where they are high, but uh, as I uh, tell before, it shows which features are strengths and which are weaknesses of uh, every, every type and every component with this type. Mm. Okay, so going to conclusions. Uh, firstly, mm, the socio-economic content of the present typology is different, although the geographical pattern is similar in the sense that uh, it suggests a dual polarization process in rural development. Uh, types of area in every region are distributed relatively uh, concentrically. As you can see, the closer to regional centers, the more favorable the rural development characteristics. Uh, and the traditional agriculture, type one, intermediate, type uh, three, and urbanized six and, six and uh, seven types are very strongly linked to the centrist periphery order. And secondly, the relatively monofunctional agriculture, types one and type uh, and two, multiple sources of income, type uh, four, uh, are very strongly linked to the central periphery. Uh, sorry, uh, type four and uh, type uh, five re are related to order resulting from history, where type one, four, and five uh, are linked to diversity that emerged in the 19th century. Uh, and type uh, second, light green with the domination of large farm agriculture is related to the border changes following uh, World War II and the development of state owned farms under communism. Um, I have to conclude that the study proves that agriculture continues uh, to be a key feature of local socioeconomic structure, influencing the 
spatial delimitation of rural areas in Poland. And the main indicators of the character of the different rural area types refer to the extent of the agrarianization of the economy and the character of the agrarian structure. Um, rural areas, even though situated far from urban centers, can achieve an average level of development provided by their development is multifunctional. Uh, and the, the agrarianization process of our local economy may be successful or not. And this success in terms of the level of socioeconomic development depends on whether agriculture is replaced by other economic functions or the populations become uh, reliant on non earned source of income. And uh, finally, um, the study shows that uh, benefits of a different kind of territorial uh, typology, which instead of classifying areas by their level of reality or by the overall socioeconomic results, tries to capture the differences in the set of territorial assets that define the character of local development processes and uh, relative successfulness. Mm, and this can be a useful diagnostic tool for rural development policies, uh, providing solid information about F effects uh, of other measures, as well as uh, suggestions for future decisions. And uh, we made some regional reports uh, for, uh, for example, Podkarpackie or Wielkopolskie voivodeships. And uh, yes, it's uh, proved that uh, some research can be helpful for uh, decision making uh, in a, a lot of territorial level. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Łukasz. Uh, now we proceed to the next presentation, uh, which will be devoted to access of uh, rural uh, to public goods and services in Ukraine, empirical and assessments and recommendations. Uh, this will be presented by Dr. Uh, Oleksiy Fryer uh, and uh, Professor Igor Prokopa uh, from the Institute for Economics and Forecasting of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alexey Freyer. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, presenting uh, the summer, some results obtained uh, by our Department of Economic and Policy of Agrarian Transformations uh, uh, <clears throat> obtained during the research work on the topic Inclusive Rural Development in Ukraine. <clears throat> first, of all, father, first of all, I have to say that further the access to public goods and services uh, will be mostly considered as uh, in terms of access to healthcare and educational services in Ukraine. <clears throat> The access to goods and services in uh, rural areas, areas as well as in their regulation had been worsening during the market transformations uh, time and subsequent uh, uh, social reforms. There are several uh, causes to be highlighted. Uh, deviation from the state social capitalism uh, principle, uh, so-called uh, optimization of social institutions, uh, reduction in consumer demand in rural areas, closure of private service uh, enterprises working on paid basis and uh, <clears throat> alteration of the road uh, infrastructure conditions. <clears throat> and while the availability of the most essential services in rural areas compared with urban uh, remain, remain worse, the share of households where one of their members could not visit the doctor uh, because of the lack of uh, the specialist with required profile. Uh, in 2018, uh, in urban areas, was uh, was 20.8% uh, uh, against the rural, rural population, 42.7%. Uh, medical treatment could not be uh, received by 16.5% uh, 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 of urban population and 2.6 uh, uh, rural and 2.6 urban, and uh, uh, cannot be could not be hospitalized in uh, rural population in rural territory. Uh, it's uh, uh, about 11%, uh, and uh, in rural areas, 1.6%. Uh, 
enable access to a good quality education in rural areas is considered in terms of such accessibility, local education level, <clears throat> tutoring opportunities, environmental influences, uh, and other. Uh, the results of the external independent national uh, evaluation of high school graduates shows uh, that the share of graduates uh, with the highest level of academic uh, achievements in rural, uh, in rural schools is two times lower than in urban uh, schools uh, by humanitarian uh, uh, subjects. And in uh, mathematics, uh, this uh, difference can see is about uh, 2.6. Uh, the, uh, the degradation of access to public goods and services in rural areas has been followed by significant stratification in terms of access, which differs in place of living and income. This is illustrated by the health care and education expenditures of 10% of rural households with the lowest and 10% with the highest level of income per capita. Rural households with the lowest uh, income spend uh, 2.8 times less on healthcare than the richest one. The difference is in uh, cost for goods, uh, such as medicines, uh, materials, equipment, uh, was uh, 1.8 uh, times and uh, for services, 5.2 times. Such difference characterizes the stratification of, this, of these groups by the volume of purchased medical goods and services and their quality. Educational expenditures of poorest households almost an, uh, almost an order lower. The difference in volume of expenditures in the richest and poorest households is one and a half times higher than the expenditures on healthcare. Such expenditures in rural uh, and urban households also attract attention. The total health care cost here do not differ significantly. However, urban households receive almost twice more benefits uh, and subsidies for health care goods and services than rural. The educational costs uh, in urban households are also significantly higher uh, and, uh, since urban areas uh, have paid schools and schools, high education on a paid basis, paid tuition in foreign languages, music, uh, arts, and other. The first mention that the state statistic committee's rate results on the health of households members uh, has given a reason to hope that the negative trends in this area have at least slowed down. The share of uh, households in which any of their members needed but could not receive medical care, medicines uh, or medical equipment decreased in 2018, although it was increasing uh, until 20 to 2017. The number of households where someone could not either buy medicine with the doctor, undergo an examination or receive other medical services also decreased. <clears throat> The share of peasants who cannot get the medical services because of the lack of required medical uh, specialists is growing. Thus, the staff shortage of the healthcare system is growing, and this problem is obviously to be uh, addressed. Uh, right. This is, is, is obviously to be is obviously to be addressed as a matter of priority, priority in the further implementation of healthcare reform. Alexei, yeah. uh, could I just interject for one second because uh, uh, your connection seems to be uh, uh, just uh, not very stable and maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, if uh, speaking slightly slower, maybe it would help uh, solve this problem because uh, parts of uh, words or sentences are being cut off and so we, I don't, I'm not sure if it's only my problem, but it seems like we're missing some parts. I'm sorry for that. I'm, I'm a little no bit problem. Excited, so, okay. The share of persons who cannot get the medical services uh, I, because of the lack of required medical uh, specialists uh, is growing. And uh, as, a, as a result, uh, we can say that the staff shortage uh, of the healthcare system is growing and this problem is obviously to, obviously to be addressed as a matter of priority in the further implementation of healthcare reform. The main reason for not receiving the necessary medical services, as well as the purchase of medicines, the rural population calls their excessive costs. 
in general, uh, the network of preschool education institutions in rural areas has increased from uh, eight, eight point five to ten. Uh, in the in 2010 uh, to 9.2 in 17 years. Instead, the number of general education institutions, uh, schools uh, continues decreasing. If in the uh, 2010 the, the the number of schools was about uh, <clears throat> 12 12.9 thousand, then in uh, 2018 uh, the, their number was uh, was 10.6 thousand. Such tendency seemingly continues because of the reduction in uh, the number of students, which in turn is associated with the uh, deteriorating demographic situation. But the decisive role was played by the optimization of the school network. <clears throat> the attitude to which is demonstrated not only by the sectoral education authorities, but also by the ex executive bodies of the territorial communities. As a result, in uh, the, the period from 11 to 17 years, the total number of students in school at the secondary school decreased uh, by 12.2%, and the number of uh, uh, this institution by 18.2%. The rate of reduction of the school network in rural areas during uh, 15, 17 years was more, more than twice, as high as in uh, 11, 15 years. And the network of primary and lower secondary school was rapidly declining. So according to local reports, then going optimization of the school network, problems with the transportation of pupils, uh, the organization of education, cause peasants uh, dissatisfaction and uh, protest. It can be assumed that if peasants were uh, straight on their self-assessment of access to education services, the result would be similar, similar to the assessment of access to healthcare system. Okay. Involving uh, improving the rural access, in particular peasants of small and remote villages, low-income people uh, to public services is an extremely important task of the inclusive rural development. It lies in line with the Global Sustainable Development Goals approved by the UN General Assembly in 2015 and the corresponding uh, national goals set out in the drafts is out in the Sustainable Development Strategy to Ukraine until uh, 2030. The reforms of local self-government, education and healthcare launched in, uh, launched in uh, 2014, 15 years uh, should help to solve this problem. Each of them is aimed at solving pressing problems in the relevant field, uh, while the, the reforms in the field of education and healthcare take into account the changes that are taking place in the territorial and organizational structure uh, of society during local development reform. Thus, Positive changes in the access of various rural groups, public services, will depend on uh, the efficiency of the local self-government organization and the organization of public services on the ground, locally. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexei. The, the technical issues were uh, <laughs> compensated by the quality of your presentation, so I hope all the participants were able to uh, understand uh, everything. Uh, if not, uh, there's always uh, room for questions uh, in the, later on. Uh, now for the next presentation, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Uh, Dr. Eugenia Lukasenko uh, from the National Institute for Economic Research uh, in Moldova who uh, would present us uh, uh, on a topic uh, entitled Recent Trends in the Development of Rural Areas uh, of the Republic of Moldova. Please. So good afternoon. Uh, so thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, having this opportunity to be a part of such an important event. Um, also, um, I would like to mention that uh, during um, uh, during my connection to this conference, I, I experienced some uh, some unstable connection issues. So that is why, I, I, uh, with your permission, I will uh, turn off my camera. So maybe the connectivity would uh, go better. Thank you. 
just a second to share my presentation. Okay, do you see it? Yes, thank you. So thank you very much. So um, the Republic of Moldova is, fa is facing um, some of the most important development challenges across the Europe with lowest levels of fertility, an aging population and high immigration rates. Uh, from this perspective, of course, um, inclusive growth is one of the main priorities for the Republic of Moldova. Rural uh, urban disparities that are currently existing in the country need to be somehow bridged by creating economic opportunities, improving um, access to quality education and healthcare services, as well as accessible and efficient public services. So um, from the administrative um, uh, point of view of the organization of the territory of the country, so we have 13 municipalities, 53 cities, 41 localities within the composition of cities, 916 villages, 600 uh, 59 localities within the commune, communes, within the villages, meaning, uh, and total of 1,682 1, uh, localities, including the Transnistria region. So the Republic of Moldova is a rural country with about 57% uh, of the country's population living in rural areas. According to the national statistics in 2019, over 2 million of uh, 3.5 million citizens lived in rural areas. At the same time, currently, the National Bureau of Statistics has issued the new figures for the total number of population based on habitual residents. And um, uh, this habitual residents meaning that excluding the long-term migrants. So, and the number of population according to the habitual residents is constantly decreasing from 2.9 million inhabitants in 2014 till 2.6 in 2021. So this proves as a high uh, level of migration. Uh, uh, it has a very significant importance, uh, this phenomenon in the decline of the population of the country, especially in the rural areas, because starting with 2000, almost, 900,000 people I estimated to have left the country. At the national level, due to the revision of the labor force survey, agriculture share in employment dropped from 39% uh, to 21% between uh, 2018 and 2019. For rural areas, agricultural sector is still the main generator of working places. Thus, in 2020, 36.6% uh, of rural employed population was engaged in agricultural activities, uh, followed by public administration, education, and health, where 22% of rural population were engaged, and industry 14%. In comparison to urban areas, so they are uh, in urban areas, 25% uh, of employed population activates in wholesale and retail and trade. During 2014-2020, the unemployment rate in rural areas is below the average per country and has been fluctuated between 1.8 and 5.3, reaching a figure of 3.3% in 2020. So for urban areas, this um, rate is quite high. Even if during 2014-2020 disposable income in rural areas increased with about 83%, um, still strong inequalities are noticed between the rural urban environments. Disposable income of rural inhabitants in 2020 account for 73% of disposable income of urban citizens. Important differences um, are also noted among the structure of disposable income. Uh, thus, for rural areas, 40% um, of the total disposable income belongs to salary activity followed by 20.7 from social benefits, 15.2 uh, from individual agricultural activity. The structure for urban rail areas is a little bit different, where 61% um, belongs to salary activities, 17, uh, about 80% to social benefits and other incomes, um, and um, uh, about 6.5% from individual non-agricultural activity. 
During uh, 2014-2020, consumption expenditures in rural areas increased with about 52%, while in urban with 64%. Consumption expenditures of rural inhabitants in 2020 accounted for only 67% of the consumption expenditures of urban citizens. Uh, even with less consumption expenditures, inhabitants of rural areas have almost the same structure of these expenditures as the urban one. Therefore, about 47% go to food products, 17% uh, to home maintenance, 9% to clothes, buying clothes and shoes. Uh, at the same time, uh, of course, compared to urban uh, residents, rural ones have lower expenditures for transport and entertainment, uh, restaurants and cafes. Um, there is a significant gap between the absolute level of poverty in urban and rural areas. So this indicator accounts for 14 urban and 35 for rural. So the highest exposure um, to poverty in rural areas is people uh, living in rural uh, households run by the elderly, single retired women, and families uh, with adults with disabilities. So the poor condition of physical infrastructure is another factor that limits the development possibilities of rural areas in the Republic of Moldova. <clears throat> the existing um, physical infrastructure needs repair or reconstruction. Um, the quality and reliability of water supply and sewage systems uh, is in a um, precarious state, especially um, uh, because for example, water quality does not always correspond to hygienic requirements. So uh, households in rural areas are much less equipped with living facilities compared to households in urban areas. So in addition to electricity, uh, which has 100% uh, coverage uh, in uh, all over the country, so rural households are lacking hot water, central heating and sewage systems. Out of the just comparative figures, so out of 55 urban localities, 53 are insured with public water supply systems. Out of 1,478 uh, 1, villages, only half of them have access to public water supply systems in 2020. So in the last year, the number of villages with access to water system increased with about 100. Um, in terms of the, uh, the sewage systems, out of 55 urban localities, 52 are insured with public sewage systems. At the same time, out of uh, 1,478 villages, only 72 of them in 2020 have access to public sewage system, which is a very, very low, um, low figure. In the last five years, the number of villages with access to sewage system increased from 52 to 72, but this figure represents only about 5% of the total number of existing villages. At the same time, the condition of uh, local roads is worse. Only a small percentage of them is being in a satisfactory technical condition. Mm, although um, the roads to every village uh, in the Republic of Moldova are paved, the precarious condition of uh, local and village roads uh, causes um, considerable damage to vehicles and transported products. So uh, obviously this leads to increased transportation cost as well as some negative, um, negative effects. The um, quality of production as well as sales prices through the supply chain. Uh, rural tourism uh, plays an important role in the economic, social and cultural development of rural areas and is increasing in the last years. So recent practices show that rural tourism can be closely linked to agricultural production, meaning uh, that it can be organized in small farms. As you see, for example, these are some, um, some pictures of uh, small farms from the Republic of Moldova that provide for tourism and accommodation services. Such an um, activity like tourism could demonstrate uh, the traditional ambience and the way of life, uh, some cultural and historical tradition, and it, uh, in, the in the future, uh, we expect it to become a quite profitable economic activity for the rural population, especially for small farmers and family farms. Um, also, during the, this presentation, I will pass to my second, uh, second chapter the, on recent evolutions and changes in public support for the development of rural areas. So, we have... Um, just a moment, please. Um, so, we have... Um, allocation of post-investment subsidies from the uh, subsidy program. Uh, 
measure for improvement and development of rural infrastructure, which is mainly intended for agricultural enterprises located outside the village. So here we are not talking about the entire rural development, but um, uh, these measures are granted uh, to agricultural enterprises, but for the development of rural infrastructure. So it has three components, construction, reconstruction, renovation of infrastructure related to legally owned agricultural holding. So we have um, um, reconstruction, construction of rural agritourism pension and creation of or extension of handicraft units. So in terms of the first component, so there are um, different subcomponents. So for example, for construction and rehabilitation of roads and access bridges to agricultural holdings. So a beneficiary may uh, request 50% for construction, 40% for rehabilitation of the cost of the investment made, not more than 500,000 lay per beneficiary. For construction and rehabilitation of gas, water supply, and sewage systems, it's also about um, varying 40-50% uh, of subsidies for the cost made, but no more than 400-600,000 labor beneficiary. So in euros, this would be about 20,000-30,000. 20, uh, Power uh, supply lines and equipment benefits uh, of a reimbursement of 50% of investment costs, but not more than uh, 800,000 lay. And there are also uh, some uh, sub measures connected to investment main construction on equipment of water wells, water towers, uh, pumps related to wells, uh, rehabilitation of water accumulation basins for irrigation and so on. So the second component is construction, reconstruction and renovation of rural agritourism pensions. So a beneficiary may um, ask for 50% of the cost of the investment made eligible for subsidy, but not more than 1 million lay per beneficiary, which is about um, 50,000 euros. So um, what are the um, sub components uh, of this sub measure? It's construction of uh, operational buildings and installations related to utility networks, purchase of equipment, furniture, um, works for the preparation of land related to agritourism, recreation and entertainment pensions. And the third component, so the beneficiary may ask for 50% of the cost of the investment made eligible for subsidy, but not more than 30,000 lay per beneficiary. And this money are granted for construction, modernization, extension of operational buildings and utilities related to craft units, purchase of new machinery, equipment, furniture, tools, devices, and so on. So uh, this would be some figures uh, related to, uh, to this measure. So it, it was introduced in 2015. So we already see some progress. So the number of subsidized projects increased from 50 to 116 in 2019. So um, most, the most popular measure here is the construction, reconstruction, and renovation of infrastructure related to agricultural holdings. What is important to mention that out of the total um, amount of the subsidy fund, which uh, is about uh, 1 uh, milliard Moldovan lei uh, um, equivalent with uh, 50 uh, million uh, euros, so allocations for these measures accounts for only 1.7% in 2019, which is quite low. Um, taking into account that the previous subsidy measures are focused on the economic agent, uh, agent and not on the rural development itself, um, necessary for, for communities and um, uh, for inhabitants. So in 2019, it was a Mm, approved the regulation on granting of subsidies for the improvement of living and working conditions in rural areas from the National Fund for the Development of Agriculture and Rural Areas. So this is the, we call it the subsidy fund. So there are three measures uh, which can be um, subsidized in advance, not post-investment like the previous one, but in advance. And they are related to improvement and development of rural public economic infrastructure. And um, uh, allocation should be up to 5% of the total value of the fund. Renovation and development of rural localities 
the same up to 5% of the total value of the fund and diversification of rural economy through non-agricultural activities up to 5% of the total value of the fund. So the first measure related to improvement and development of rural public economic infrastructure. It's meant for construction uh, of local public roads, bridges, um, uh, better connectivities between local roads, and uh, extension, modernization of water supply, water purification, sewage systems, and so on. So the applicant is a first level administrative territorial unit. The project is implemented mandatory in a rural locality. The total cost of the eligible project does not exceed the amount of 3 million lei. The implementation period, 24 months. And the financial contribution of the applicant is at least 20% of the total cost of the investment project. So for the second uh, sub-measure, uh, uh, the second measure related to uh, renovation and development of rural localities, there are uh, several sub-measures. So uh, most of them are related to creation, improvement, and extension of basic local services for rural population, including leisure, culture, as well as um, other related structure. This means re renovation of public buildings, local Bethesda and streets, energy production using renewable resources, development of social services, construction of kindergartens, purchase of ve vehicles and snow removal equipment, and so on. So we also have the measure, some measure related to conservation, restoration of the um, historical heritage buildings and the rural natural landscapes. So these are uh, historical sites, uh, rural cultural landscapes, places of cultural historical memory, rural museums, botanical gardens, uh, zoos, um, and so on. So we also have a submeasure related to restoration and rehabilitation of historical monuments specific to traditional rural architecture, old wineries, mills, boyar mansions, with the emphasis on development of rural tourism. Another one is related to preservation of intangible heritage and the own traditions of the local community, such as music, dance, folklore, ethnography, traditional professions, and creation of visitor centers in protected areas. So the conditions, the mandatory conditions are the same as for the first measure. So the applicant should be first level administrative territorial unit, project implemented in rural locality, implementation period 24 months, maximum amount 3 millions, and at least 20% of initial contribution, financial contribution of the total um, uh, cost of the investment project. And we have the third submeasure, diversification of rural economy through non-agricultural activities, which uh, was a submeasure mainly required by economic agents from a rural area, um, because taking into account that the first two um, um, are mostly related to administrative territorial units and they are in charge of implementation. So here, um, the main implementers, the applicants are legal persons, but they should be micro and small enterprises or natural persons who carry out entrepreneurial activity. They have to be registered mandatory in a rural locality who intends to develop non-agricultural activities. So the project implementation does not exceed 24 months. The financial contribution is at least 50%, and the total cost of eligible project does not exceed the amount of 1 million lei. So what kind of projects are accepted here? Uh, diversification of rural economy by increasing the number of micro and small enterprises, which is um, veterinary services, non-agricultural system machinery, uh, endowment of cinemas, local televisions, radios, education and training centers for acquisition of prof professions, um, as well as development of social services for vulnerable groups. So also we have projects regarding the preservation, development and diversification of traditional handicrafts and crafts activities, and projects regarding the development and promotion of rural tourism services and activities, of, uh, as well as outdoor activities. So basically uh, within these uh, measures, introduced only in 2019. The first allocation of uh, funds was done in 2020, so they are quite new measures. So till now, till the end of 2020, unfortunately, we do not uh, have figures for 2021. So the following were achieved. So 15 kilometers of public roads were modernized, 23 kilometers of water supply systems were rehabilitated, Two water pumping stations were reconstructed, five kilometers of sewage systems were rehabilitated, 40 kilometers of street lightning were modernized, 18 vehicles and 33 snow removal equipment were purchased, and 14 public buildings were renovated, uh, four kindergartens, uh, community centers, health centers, and schools. 
what is new for 2022 in terms of rural development, so um, uh, public support. So we are expecting the leader program, uh, which will be a state program managed by the Minister of Agriculture and Food Industry, and, uh, under which uh, local action groups can request funding based on an operational plan and an appropriate budget from the National Fund for Agriculture and Rural Development, meaning the subsidy fund. So allocation of funds should be up to 5% of the total value of the National Fund for Agriculture and Rural Development. Therefore, starting from 2022, we will have about 20% of the uh, total value of the National Fund for Agriculture and Rural Development allocated for rural development, which is um, very new uh, for the Republic of Moldova, and of course uh, created some controversies among, especially from for, from the side of agricultural producers, because um, that means that um, um, the finance, the funds available within this uh, this fund, uh, they increase uh, for rural development actions means they decrease for agriculture. Uh, so yeah. Um, in order to conclude, I would like to mention that rural areas are uh, facing particular challenges in terms of growth, jobs, sustainability, um, the lack of opportunities, communication and training infrastructure is a major problem for remote rural areas. Uh, at the same time, uh, they offer some real opportunities in terms of uh, growth potential in new sectors, provision of rural facilities and tourism. They have some attractiveness as a place to live uh, and work. So especially during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, some um, small trends have been noticed of people who were um, uh, starting to move to rural villages nearby, of course, the capital city still. But uh, so in this context, uh, the current rural development policy offers um, a quite a wide a range of opportunities to support the diversification need for development, employment and sustainable development in rural areas. But of course, some impact assessment um, analysis uh, uh, should be made in about uh, three to five years in order to assess, um, to assess the efficiency of these public support measures. So basically this is all what I wanted you to, 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 uh, to, to mention. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting to see uh, such information about Moldova. You don't often find such uh, uh, good materials to understand what's going on in such uh, nearby countries. So thank you very much again. Uh, the next issue to be discussed uh, uh, are the corruption risks and mitigation measures in land relations in Ukraine, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Oksana Rykovska. Uh, of the Institute for Economics and Forecasting of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. Please. Uh, we see your presentation, but cannot hear you if you're speaking. Excuse me, please. Good afternoon for all. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the results of our research, corruption risks and mitigation measures in land relations in Ukraine. Uh, this topic is closely related to human rights. Corruption is one of the factors limiting opportunities for most Ukrainian peasants, as well as the population of many other countries, first of all, middle and low income countries, to resist large-scale agricultural holdings and land grabbing. Accordingly, they lose access to land resources, to basic necessities such as food and water, which are a mean of subsistence and a decent standard of living. Corruption facil uh, facilities such as violations by a law and actor involved to bypass existing legal safeguards that were designed to protect against such abuses. The purpose of our study was to identify, or, uh, identify, identify of corruption risk and uh, land relations, identification of specific factors that prove corruption in agricultural land used for creating the system of preventive measures and the establishment of regulatory safeguards to limit corruption in land transactions and protect human rights. Next slide, please. Corruption in... Uh, uh, no, 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 no. 
previous, please. Corruption in land relations is an external negative factor that destroys the system of fair land use and leads to violation of the rights and legitimate interests of land users and land owners, especially the poorest and most vulnerable. Laws of state and communal lands. Reduction of revenues to state and local budgets, which negatively affects the welfare of the entire population of all, uh, all people. Rural people, peasants, suffer the most from corruption abuses. They have neither the financial, nor the institutional, nor the technical ability to resist a well-established corruption network, defend their right and protect land ownership. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. According to Transparency International, one or in five people in the world paid a bribe for access to land services. Land plots are one of the most expensive and valuable assets, and due to their high liquidity, they become a tasty morsel for all kinds of fraudsters. Corruption traditionally falls into the top three problems of Ukrainian, according to the result of various sociological studies. Entrepreneurs and experts include land corruption in the leader of corruption abuses. And so uh, all uh, the attention of all anti-corruption bodies is focused on land relation. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, the most common shadow schemes of offenses in the agricultural land use are illegal, transfer of land for use, violation of the bidding procedure, abuse through registration actions, fraud. Types of corruption present in this slide uh, uh, was um, prepared by National Agency of Corruption Prevention in Ukraine in uh, the, uh, 2021. Next slide, please. These schemes are the result of a number of institutional failures, which are based on unsystematic, politically and economically based actions in the land relations. The main sources of corruption schemes in Ukraine are the following. Regulatory imperfection, sometimes a contradiction of legislative norms. Absence of accurate information about communal properties, land plots about the concluded contracts. Lack of complete information about lands in the state land cadastre. Absence of transparent access to information of, uh, on uh, vacant land plots. Uh, discretionary power of state geocadastre. Selective legislation's application at its own discretion within the limits of the law. The presence of duplicate licensing procedures, individual dehonesty uh, of um, officials. Uh, next slide, please. Corruption is difficult to measure. It is difficult to prove an offense with illegal gain, and most researchers are looking for ind indirect evidence of violations. In world practice, it has been proven that an important features and under, uh, indirect evidence of corruption, violence in land relations is the large-scale land deals that are defined as land grabbing. The problem of large-scale land deals is not unique for uh, Ukrainian reality. Many low-income countries suffer from agricultural holdings. Uh, Land Matrix open platform helps to investigate agri holdings activity. The Land Matrix is an independent land monitoring initiative that promotes transparency and accountability in decision over large scale land acquisitions in low and middle income countries by capturing and sharing data about these deals at global, regional, and uh, national level. There are detailed information about deals in almost 100 countries. To be included in the Land Matrix Global Database, uh, deals must meet the following criteria. Entail a transfer of right to use, control, or ownership 
of land through sale, lease, uh, or, or concession have been initiated since the year 2000, cover an area of 200 uh, hectares or more, involves the change of land use, often from extensive or ecosystem service provision to commercial use. Next slide. Uh, recent years have witnessed a significant increase in large-scale acquisitions or lists of land and countries with weak governance and poor government accountability are being particularly targeted. Uh, there exists a statistically significant correlation between levels of perceived co uh, corruption index and the likelihood of land-scale land deals. It is a result of many international researchers. According to Land Matrix Public Database, 255 land deals meet the international criteria of large deals in Ukraine. 3.4 million hectares of land, which is more than 8% of the total area of agricultural land, according to the expert estimates, its scale is twice the official data, are cultivated by about 200 companies. In Romania, 59 large-scale land deals uh, and 3.5% uh, agricultural land. Uh, Poland, there are no large-scale land deals, uh, but uh, the doctor uh, Lukasz Kamerowski uh, in, uh, the, in uh, his presentation uh, uh, on the map uh, presents that uh, large-scale agriculture on the north of Poland. And I don't know why uh, land matrix don't uh, include, include uh, Poland uh, evidence. Moldova uh, has uh, six large-scale land deals and uh, 4.6 agricultural land and uh, cover the um, big uh, deals. Lithuania, one large-scale land deals, um, and um, some uh, estimate for uh, participants uh, of our conference. Five counties are presented at the conference, among all Ukraine and Moldova are in a similar situation. We have a significant share of land under large agreements, a low rating on the Corruption Perceptation Index. Uh, Ukraine 117, Moldova 115. In other countries, this connection is not so close, which indicates a more responsible position of the government on land relations. Next slide, please. Uh, the result of the study shows a statistical correlation between levels of corruption and the likelihood uh, of land scale land uh, transactions. The result of this analysis of more than 50 counties show that in the countries that are in the first half of the ranking according to the Corruption Perceptation Index, no large land transactions have been recorded. Uh, B, in countries whose population view corruption as an objective reality and perceive it as a mental feature, large-scale land deals cover higher share of agricultural land. The corruption schemes open up opportunities for shadow business and unscrupulous investors to grab land, monopolize power, and violate the risk, uh, the right of those who cannot resist the powerful land grab. Next slide, please. Corruption of land relations in Ukraine is confirmed by investment flowers coming from offshore zone. The external investors compete against local communities for access to the land and resources on which these communities depend. Because of the considerable differences in the respective purchasing power of the parties involved, it is likely that external investor will easily outcompete outcompete local land and resource uses in purchasing process that has resulted from the establishment of a market for land right. The um, defining feature of offshore is in, in addition to optimize avoiding taxation is the legalization of criminal, including corrupt income. Uh, 
withdrawal of capital to countries with simplified legislation and the absence of any control and transparency, followed by legal investment in the required assets, is a well-known scheme of financial transaction with a train, uh, with a train of tainted past. 25 countries invest in agricultural lands of Ukraine. The average size of land deals range from 2 uh, and 5.6 thousand hectares investments from Germany and the United Kingdom to 24.2 and uh, 27.3 thousand hectares investments from Cyprus and Canada. Next slide. Based on the results of many foreign research, it is determined that indirect but proven evidence of corruption in land relations are the number of large land transactions and the volume of agricultural land, which is concentrated in a limited number of uses. Prevalence of investment flowers from offshore areas. The existence of a monopoly on the exercise of power in the field of land relations from the development of regulatory and technical documents, state standards, norms and rules, land management and land variation to the organization and implementation of state supervision and taking measures to prevent viol uh, violations in the land sphere. Next slide. Anti the corruption initiatives and actions in land policy in the context of equitable special development and protection of human rights. Uh, first of all, introduction of publicity mechanism, transparency and information open, uh, openness. Announcement of intentions to conduct land transactions, opening of the operation procedure, dissemination of information on approved agreements and transactions will reduce the interest of corruptors and protect legal actions. Second point, highlighting the direction to counter the concentration of agricultural land use in the draft anti-corruption strategy 2020. 1. 2025. Development of a special mechanism for concluding large agreements with mandatory verification of fund sources, verification of information about the ultimate beneficial owners and verifying the veracity of the corporate ownership structure with the permanent monitoring of uh, impact uh, of uh, concentrated land use on the observance of the rights of local population and preservation of the environment. The third point, implementation of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative in the land relations. The publication of contract between investors and the government or the competent state authorities is a way to ensure transparency and accountability of fund uh, funds usage. For large land transactions, transparency of fund is not basic information that need to be disclosed to local communities and the general public. Disclosure of the contract terms will be much more, more useful in the fight against corruption on land deals. And fourth point, improving the condition of the open government partnership. Introduction of regulation concerning expansion of the list of person, inclusion um, whose property and asset must be included in the declaration of officials working in areas of high corruption risk, in particular in the field of land usage, will promote transparency and increase effectiveness to actions to prevent corruption in public sector. The emergence of land market is seen as a conductive to economic growth due to the fact that lowering transaction cost is expected to result in land going to the most productive user, thus maximizing the productivity of land as an economic asset. However, the reality is often very different. Once it is treated as a commodity, land often goes to the buyers with the highest purchasing power, not to those who need it more and can use its more productivity, uh, productively. Unfortunately, due to corruption schemes, significant power 
poverty and the inability to resist large capital, Ukrainian peasants will not be able to become active players in the land market. They will be excluded from active action and without effective state support aimed in protection, the right of peasant policy, they may be landless in the near future. Next slide. Thank you very much. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, for the next presentation, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Monica Tudor uh, from the Institute of Agricultural Economics, Romanian Academy, uh, who will present uh, the topic, rural development and inclusive growth in Romania. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to organizer for inviting me to, to present something in this conference and also for uh, let's say your understanding because we switch a lot a little bit uh, the program and I hope that shouldn't, uh, was uh, nothing that should to disturb all the activities. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I will try to share my screen now uh, to uh, present uh, actually uh, my uh, uh, my idea. Um, uh, I, please confirm it if you see my screen. Yes, it is on. Okay, perfect. Um, actually, I decided to insert here a subtitle for my presentation, and because uh, uh, was a little bit cha uh, uh, challenging for me to discussing about inclusiveness uh, in uh, Romania, uh, and uh, especially for rural development, uh, and uh, because uh, during this year I worked. Uh, uh, more for a uh, project uh, of the World Bank and uh, Ministry of Agriculture to try to define uh, how to uh, uh, spend the money from the next programming period in the in the um, uh, national uh, plan for uh, rural development. Um, uh, we look a little bit about uh, the structure of the funds. Uh, and the implementation uh, of the common agricultural uh, policy in the previous uh, period. And um, my presentation today will be concentrated on this aspect of inclusiveness of the CAP implementation. And uh, I will try to show you some, some figures and idea related to this, uh, this aspect, how inclusive is actually the implementation of this policy in Romania. If my question, my, my, my main question was, uh, if the common agricultural policy real responds uh, to the real needs of the rural development in Romania and for agriculture or not. And, but to, uh, to have this uh, big image uh, and uh, to, uh, to make an, uh, uh, statement on this uh, aspect. Uh, firstly, I think that we need to present something related to Romania. How is um, rural development, uh, how um, uh, the, the main figures related to the rural area in Romania to make an overview about these aspects of um, uh, rural realities actually for our country and uh, I concentrated my, my first uh, part of the presentation on this overview of Romania rural area uh, and we'll look on the human capital, uh, uh, basic rural services coverage in, uh, in my countries um, and uh, the structure and employment of rural economy. Uh, after this uh, small introduction or uh, related to uh, the Romanian rural area, uh, I uh, try to put in a, a slide how, which are the main needs of, for the inclusive growth or rural development related to and extracted from this, um, this uh, short presentation of uh, the rural uh, realities. Uh, and after that, um, um, I will try to uh, go on the implementation of the pillar one and pillar two from the common agricultural policy and to see how inclusive are those 
to pillar implementation uh, in uh, Romania in the last uh, programming period because uh, I concentrated on this uh, on this uh, uh, period uh, of the implementation and um, we try to go to some conclusion after uh, after that. Uh, actually, the conclusion are a little bit previsible because you will see uh, from my presentation how the, um, the money from the pillar one and pillar two was spent in Romania and and uh, if and you could uh, have an image how uh, they respond to the real needs of the rural development in uh, in my country. And, but to start with this big picture, this overview of Romania. This is a map of Romania at the level of NATS 3. Uh, um, and uh, if you see here, um, it is the distribution uh, about, related to the urban rural typology uh, of uh, our country. And uh, if uh, um, you will, it's not necessary to count, but we have 42 nuts three region in Romania, and from those, uh, only two are uh, predominantly urban. Are here in the in the Bucharest, uh, the capital city of the country. Um, we have twelve intermediate regions, and the rest of the regions are predominantly rural. So in Romania, uh, half of the Romanians live actually in rural area. Uh, if we compare this uh, this share with the European Union, we we'll see that in the European Union, uh, one in five uh, people live in rural areas. But in Romania, this uh, this uh, share is much higher, one in two. Um, two thirds of the uh, Romanian territory is covered by the rural area. So the rural development actually it's uh, very important for our country. So we need to uh, have a good policy and not only and good programs for uh, move forward in the rural development. Uh, if we compare the share of population that live in rural area in Romania and uh, in Europe, uh, we see in this graph, uh, which is the situation. So uh, seems that in the, during the last programming period, the share of the population living in predominantly rural regions uh, um, decreased, but not significantly in Romania. But we still have 40, uh, 53 percent of the population that live in the, those uh, regions, compared with the European Union, uh, in which only uh, um, 20 percent of the population live in rural areas. So, even from the, not only in the territory, which for the population, the rural development in Romania seems to uh, and is very important and needs um, to be uh, carefully uh, treated uh, during the policy implementation and policy design, actually. Um, the main, let's say, uh, direction and evolution uh, in the demographic, from the demographical perspective related to the human capital um, I uh, put it here two uh, indicators. One is related to the share of the uh, older population, popula uh, people uh, that have uh, 75 um, uh, years and over. And um, if we look and compare the situation in predominantly rural regions compared with the other regions of Romania, we see that the aging is more pronounced in the rural area and it uh, and it's actually accelerated uh, actually 20 percent of the population uh, in uh, rural area in predominantly rural regions in Romania is old is older uh, actually uh, it's not, it's nothing new but uh, for Romania uh, this is, is an accelerated trend in aging of the rural population and needs to be uh, carefully treated because you know, we know uh, that those people need uh, special attention and they uh, need medical uh, and uh, care 
and uh, other services uh, that needs to be present in the rural area. Uh, the second element uh, related to the human capital that uh, I stress, I put it here, it's related to the unemployment. And uh, if uh, I compare uh, the different type of regions according to the urban rural typology, in Romania, we see that in the uh, predominantly rural region, uh, the, un the uh, unemployment rate is bigger in rural compared with the uh, rest of the region. Uh, this uh, is a reality not only uh, at the level of the entire population, but uh, active population. But uh, uh, I think that uh, we need to have a closer look um, to the younger generation in rural area. Uh, and for those people, we see that the uh, level of unemployment is uh, uh, very high. And uh, we need to, to do something uh, for keep those people in rural area to give them job because uh, and uh, we know we know that the younger generation uh, is not so much uh, so much uh, uh, in inclined to go in the agriculture. They don't want to, to work in other sector of economy, not in agriculture. Uh, but for that, they need to, to have a proper education and skills. And uh, to keep them in rural area needs to generate off-farm jobs uh, and give them a good education uh, to, to be able to work in this uh, new uh, off-farm jobs that need and require um, some technological skills. Uh, also related to the, the human capital, um, and uh, it's this level of education and uh, up, uh, and if we look here in the predominantly uh, rural region we see uh, that uh, the population that live in uh, rural region have a lower level of uh, training and education we here we're discussing about the active population and see that um, 34 percent of the population have less than primary uh, and the lower secondary education level uh, uh, lower than two in each of the um, uh, classification. So this uh, could be an, uh, let's say, uh, an uh, indicator of the need of training uh, of the rural population and investment in the education and uh, training for uh, those people, uh, not only uh, at the level of the entire population, but most uh, uh, pronounced uh, the idea is to invest in the education of the younger generation. Um, also, I, I show you before uh, uh, some figure related to the uh, elderly people and the share of age and the impact of aging in the rural population. Uh, and um, uh, here in the second graph, I show you uh, how many inhabitants in the rural area and other regions of Romania uh, uh, are uh, rep um, reported for the one physician. And we, he we show, we, we see here that we haven't, during the, this uh, implementation of the, of the programming period, uh, uh, from 20, uh, 2014 to 2020, uh, the, the number of inhabitants per physician decreased, but it's still very, very high in the rural um, uh, counties compared with the rest of the, of the rest of the country. If we have in mind the fact that uh, the percent of the uh, um, aged population is is very high in, in those uh, in those region. Uh, we uh, we could have in, uh, in mind that we need to invest in the services for uh, healthcare uh, in this area, and uh, social services need to be present there. And a huge investment in this in this aspect aspect is necessary uh, for uh, keeping and uh, rural development uh, at the level of an uh, um, inclusive uh, um, to have an inclusive uh, inclusive uh, rural development for uh, for this uh, uh, areas. So uh, 
other elements related to the uh, infrastructure in a rural area. Uh, and I put here a lot of three gra graphs actually related to the uh, main infrastructure uh, present and, uh, in the rural area. And we are discussing about roads, discussing about the water network and uh, sewerage network in the rural uh, area. And uh, if we look on those three graphs, we see judge the uh, during the implementation of the current programming period, um, the number of um, uh, uh, municipalities that, that have this type of networks increase uh, actually the and uh, the the uh, uh, let's say length of the network increase also. But if we go more in deeper in analyzing the information we'll see, judge, this, this increase is not significantly enough to generate an inclusive growth because uh, in this moment, uh, we have less than uh, half of the rural roads modernized. So we need to invest more in this, uh, in this aspect in Romania. Uh, the investments do uh, generated an increase of this per, uh, of this share, but is not enough. Uh, related to the uh, water network in rural communities, uh, we uh, we see here that we have an increase increases in territorial coverage uh, of the public uh, water network, uh, and uh, even for the for the sewerage network, we have an increase in the share of the co rural communities that access, uh, have access to this type of network. But, but in the same time, we we'll see that uh, uh, the length of these uh, networks is, is uh, uh, it's, uh, small in the rural communities. Uh, we have only uh, 25 kilometers um, of uh, water network uh, per com commune, rural commune, and uh, only 14.5.4 uh, 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 kilometer of network for, for sewerage in rural communities. So the access uh, to the water uh, and sewerage networks in rural area is still still uh, uh, very low uh, in uh, in all uh, rural communities, and we need to to improve this aspect. Uh, if we want to have an inclusive grow, grow uh, in a rural area and uh, those infrastructure are uh, very important not only for the uh, standard of living of the population but also for the uh, for the development of the business in the rural area so we still need to uh, to invest uh, through rural development program uh, in this uh, this uh, um, basic services uh, for the rural communities in Romania. Related to the structure of the rural economy, I uh, uh, put it here, uh, the last information that we, uh, um, we uh, find out uh, in the Eurostat related to the employment structure and the gross value added structure uh, in the predominantly rural and intermediate region to have an image about uh, the evolution of those indicators uh, uh, during the implementation of the last programming, uh, of the current programming period. Um, and uh, if we look on the predominantly rural region, we, we see that the agriculture still represents uh, the bigger employer uh, in the rural economy. Um, 33% of the total employed population works in agriculture and forestry and uh, fishing. Uh, which uh, it's, uh, in, it's uh, in the same time, if we compare this employment with the contribution of those people that work in agriculture to the gross value added, we see that uh, the importance of uh, primary sector uh, in the um, uh, production and the gross value added is not so is not as higher as the employment. Uh, 
an uh, important element that uh, uh, I want to stress out in this moment is related to the importance of the industry uh, development uh, in the rural uh, uh, regions. Uh, if we look uh, in those in this graph, we see that uh, the share of the people that are working in the industry increased from 20% to 21.6% uh, from 20, uh, 2030 2018. Uh, which we have in the same time, if we look on the gross value added structure, we see that uh, in the predominantly rural region uh, was a significantly uh, higher increase in the uh, contribution of the industry to the um, gross value added of the uh, of the rural area so uh, we seems that uh, this industry is the engine of the economic development in the in the rural area and in the same time if you look at the uh, tertiary sector productive tertiary sector well, well seed uh, transport accommodation uh, food services we see that uh, the, an increase of the percentage of people that are working in this sector, and in the same time as in the case of industry, if we compare, if we look on the gross value added, we see that uh, this sector, this tertiary sector, generate uh, um, increase uh, significantly increased in the gross value added uh, uh, in the in the uh, analyzed period. So, seems that this is another engine of the rural uh, development uh, related to the economy. Uh, the same situation seems to, to apply for the intermediate uh, region of uh, Romania, but with, uh, with uh, particular attention to the share of the people that are working in agriculture, uh, that it's significantly lower in, in intermediate regions compared uh, with the predominantly uh, rural region. So, as main needs, looking on, on, on this uh, figure uh, and thinking about the main needs for the inclusive rural development, uh, I could say that, say that uh, we need to increase the level of training. This is the, uh, an important issue and uh, for generated an inclusive rural development, we need uh, to improve the training. Uh, we need to improve the access to the health services uh, in the context of the aging of the population. We need to diversify the rural jobs, especially in the direction of non-agricultural jobs to stabilize the rural uh, population, especially for the, when we're discussing about the younger generation. Uh, and and uh, not, for, not in the uh, uh, last uh, point, the increase, the increase the access to the basic services and infrastructure. But it's uh, very important, not only for the population, but uh, also for the enterprises. So I think uh, from my perspective, the, uh, that those are the main needs for an inclusive uh, rural development in, uh, uh, in my countries. Uh, but how was the money spent in the last programming period uh, when we're discussing about the pillar two related to the rural development? Here you have uh, some figure related to the share of public allocation through National Rural Development uh, Program. Uh, uh, that is uh, stru structured about uh, uh, to the, uh, to the um, main measure that was uh, financed through this, uh, to this program. Uh, uh, we, we calculated the share from the all allocation that was distributed for, uh, di uh, for different measure in the uh, pillar two of the uh, common agricultural policy. Uh, and um, if um, we aggregated those, uh, those share, we see that the agriculture received 69% uh, of the allocation 
of the pillar down too. Uh, main beneficiary, beneficiary of rural development was primary production. Not the, not the secondary, not the tertiary sector, but agriculture. Uh, in the same time, the vertical integration of raw material from agriculture received 6%. Six, six See, this market integration of farmers uh, and farm products, those three measures received 6% uh, of the uh, allocation uh, of the National Rural Development Program. And uh, I want to say something, it's, uh, it's related to allocation, but in the same time, it's... Um, uh, because we are in the in the last uh, part of the implementation, it's uh, quite uh, uh, close to the implementation of the of the program. So it's not it's not a big difference between this allocation in the version thirty of the national rural development program and the uh, real implementation of this uh, of this program in Romania. Uh, for non agricultural business support uh, through the uh, Pillar two was allocated and spent only five percent of the um, of the budget of rural development. Uh, basic services uh, and village uh, village renewal received only nine percent, and for the leader, other six percent of the of the national rural development program was spent. So, social edu uh, infrastructure. Uh, was uh, subaddressed according to my uh, uh, to my perception. If we compare this um, um, this allocation and this expenditure with the real needs of the of the rural development and inclusive rural development, um, non agricultural business received only a limited support, only five percent. So how could we stabilize? the people in the rural area, how could we train those people if we spend uh, only 5% uh, for non-agricultural business and only 1% for, uh, for education and social infrastructure. We could not provide, we could not provide uh, enough uh, social services, we could not provide uh, enough educational and training uh, 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 services uh, in this direction to uh, to keep those people in rural area and uh, to generate an inclusive uh, growth. Uh, and in the same time, I look I look at to the uh, value of the submitted project proposal uh, and compare. Those, uh, this value with the allocation and uh, with the ex expenditure from the National Rural Development uh, Program to see how was addressed those uh, measure by the potential beneficiary. And uh, we see that the, uh, for the agricultural measure, uh, the submitted project uh, exceed only with 3% the uh, value of the National Rural Development Program allocation. Uh, for the market implementation, uh, the value of the submitted project was 33% higher compared with the allocation. But if we look on those uh, elements of uh, non-agricultural business support and business services and village uh, renewal, we see and that was um, higher interest and uh, big needs uh, comes from the rural beneficiary related to the development of non-agricultural business in rural area. And if we look here, we, he we see that the was um, uh, submitted uh, project with the value three uh, times higher uh, for the setting up of non-agricultural business compared with the allocation from the National Rural Development Program. Uh, for development of non-agricultural business, the situation is uh, it's, uh, quite similar. Uh, for the development of business services, uh, um, was to, uh, the, the value of the project submitted was two times bigger 
compared with the allocation from the National Rural Development Program. So actually the rural area and the rural actors uh, uh, ask money and goes in this direction related to the inclusive growth and inclusive de uh, development of rural area. But it seems that the allocation uh, from the, and uh, the policy support and programming support for this inclusive growth was not uh, enough targeted to the real needs and uh, real um, uh, uh, requirements of the rural uh, development uh, in Romania for the uh, current programming period. And uh, after that, we look on the pillar one implementation to see how inclusive was actually the pillar one in, uh, in Romania. Uh, I need to, to uh, uh, show you something. We have an eligibility rules from the accessing of pillar one. And uh, that means that uh, if you want to, to receive uh, uh, direct payments from the pillar one, you need to have a minimum, uh, to have a farm with the minimum one hectare uh, and uh, minimum uh, claim eligible, eligible area per plot needs to be 0 0.3 hectares and the active farmers provision. Uh, but those two elements are very, very important. The, the uh, first two elements, minimum one hectare per holding and minimum eligible area per plot 0 0.3 are very important for actually uh, setting the, uh, the scene for the implementation of the, of the pillar uh, of the pillar one. Uh, dear Monica, yeah, please. Uh, if I could just uh, point out that uh, the time uh, of, for your presentation is coming to an end, and if uh, possible, so that we would have fruitful and uh, fruitful discussion afterwards. Uh, if you could conclude in up to five minutes, that would be great. No problem. No problem. My my team is, uh, my time is it's enough because I have only three slides for for this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and here, the figure related to the coverage of the Pillar 1 payments in 2016, because we compare the uh, farm structure survey data, data with the implementation of the, uh, of the Pillar 1, how many, uh, how many farms applied and received money from the Pillar 1 from uh, direct payments and how many farms are registered in the, in the farm structure survey. And if we look here in the, in the first graph, because you have a big, actually the general and big picture. We see that in Romania, we have 3.34 uh, million holdings. And from those holdings, uh, only 1.55 um, uh, uh, exceed one hectare. Uh, this, those are the, the figures from the, from the farm, farm structure survey. And if we look on how many uh, farms received actually direct payments uh, from the, in the 2016, we see that uh, from the all farms in Romania, only 25% um, uh, received, uh, received uh, subsidies, direct payments. Uh, if we, uh, if we uh, look at the all, all, all picture uh, on the all farm of Romania, uh, if uh, we look on the farms that actually are eligible uh, for receiving direct payments through the pillar one, uh, the farms with one hectare and over, we see that half of those farms actually receive money uh, from, direct, uh, from uh, pillar one for direct payments. Uh, Related to the area, only 73% uh, of the all uh, um, utilized agricultural area in Romania uh, benefited from support through Pillar 1 uh, in uh, 2016. And if we look on the eligible farms, the, the share is not, uh, is not, not significantly increased is only 76% uh, of the holdings that uh, have more than one hectare that received money. So the coverage rates in the case of the pillar one is not so high in Romania. Actually, 
actually uh, only 25% uh, of the of the holdings received uh, received those money because um, th this is the structure related to uh, on the uh, of, of the coverage of the pillar one uh, when we compare the different uh, let's say farm dimension and for the the smaller farms uh, between one and five hectares we see that uh, half of those farms received money from direct payments for half of the area that they operated. Uh, for the rest of the farms, bigger than five hectares, the share of the farms that received money increased significantly, increased also the, the share of the area uh, operated by those farms that uh, was cover covered by the direct payments uh, increased. I will skip this uh, uh, this data because I, uh, here it's related to the allocation uh, and uh, uh, the areas that are not covered by direct uh, payments uh, uh, in uh, 2016. And we see that for the small farms, how bigger are the area that are not covered by the um, by the direct payments and uh, the main uh, actually idea here it's about the fact that the holding with, without legal personality are those that uh, uh, lost let's say are lost uh, uh, from this uh, aspect of uh, payments uh, through the pillar one so they do not benefit it uh in the uh, for the for the payments through uh, the uh, direct payments supports uh, support but uh, if we look on the holding with legal legal personality we see that those funds uh, claim area uh, that are uh, significantly uh, higher uh, and uh, the area covered by the direct payments, uh, uh, it's uh, al almost equal with the area that they are operated. The, um, only uh, for those categories of farms uh, with 100 and, uh, and over farms, uh, hectares, uh, we see that uh, we have, uh, an, uh, let's say, uh, a smaller degree of coverage of subs uh, uh, payments, uh, but here it's related. Uh, this area is uh, most uh, uh, is mostly common land that belongs to the local uh, council, uh, and uh, for this area, actually, uh, the local council could not uh, claim um, subsidies. And uh, only uh, if this uh, common land uh, is uh, uh, transferred to uh, the holdings uh, that uh, have uh, animals, uh, and uh, uh, this land, this land could be uh, could be claimed for the subsidies because we have here uh, actually is the pasture that belongs to the local communities and. Uh, uh, only the, the farms that uh, have uh, uh, cows and sheep could claim uh, subsidies for the um, uh, pastures area that, uh, that they uh, operated. So it was a transfer between uh, the uh, local council to the farms holdings without legal personality uh, in this direction. Uh, and. Um, this is the main reason for which the holdings with legal personality uh, lost uh, the, the opportunity to, to uh, claim the, the direct payments. And this is my, let's say, conclusion slide, actually, because it's only one. Uh, and uh, the, main, the main idea related to this uh, comparison between the needs for rural development and uh, actually the coverage and expenditure and direction of expenditure from the pillar one and pillar two uh, show that from the pillar one, uh, actually 
three point uh, three uh, uh, in four uh, Romanian farms are excluded for direct payments in the pillar one, and twenty five percent of the utilized agricultural area uh, is excluded from the direct payments and. As consequences, is excluded for the gra uh, from the good agricultural and environmental condition. Uh, so, could be a, a, a problem related to this uh, exclusiveness because those uh, those area uh, are operated in, uh, let's say, not so friendly environmental condition. Could be. It's, it's not. Uh, we do not have data. To see that, but uh, uh, but uh, this is the reality. Uh, from the pillar uh, two, seems that uh, despite the fact that the, uh, we have a big need for development uh, of the non-agricultural business, the pillar two still was oriented, and I think that in the future will be oriented to agriculture. Uh, do not respond uh, properly to the uh, need of development of, of, of farm jobs and uh, needs of the diversification of rural economy. Uh, in, are also the pillar two addressed in a small extent the need of education and social assistance uh, and uh, contribute not so significantly to the development of uh, the basic services as infrastructure in uh, rural areas. So we need to, in Romania, we need to go more in deeper in analyzing uh, actually the real needs for the rural inclusive development and to try to go in this direction with the future and new um, plan for uh, uh, rural development, I'll, uh, because if we go in the same direction, uh, we have a big risk to do not cover properly the real needs and uh, to do not generate an inclusive growth for Romania. Thank you for your attention. I will stop my share yes. here. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, okay, so we have uh, we can proceed now to the uh, final part of uh, uh, our today's uh, conference and uh, finally discuss uh, some of the issues that have been raised uh, by our participants. Uh, if I may, I will share my screen so to make it easier for um, our presenters uh, to remind them of the questions asked. Uh, and the first uh, to reply to questions, as there are quite a few, I would uh, like to ask Dr. Uh, Viktor Yarovay uh, if you could turn on your microphone. And uh, uh, we have questions from three participants uh, in regard to your presentation. Would you be able to um, reflect on these issues? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. The first one is, what do you mean by small farms? Uh, I mean uh, just uh, family farms, uh, because in Ukraine there are two uh, main agricultural sectors. First one is uh, more uh, oriented on industrial agriculture and uh, have uh, huge land parcels uh, up to uh, 100,000 uh, hectares. And uh, the other sector is uh, just individual sector uh, represented usually by uh, family households, which have several hectares and uh, um, they are small farms. How do you see the role and influence of large agricultural complexes in, in the development of rural areas in Ukraine? Um, large agricultural uh, holdings uh, just oriented on uh, commercial effect and uh, produce uh, 
commercial, attractive uh, and export uh, oriented crops like uh, wheat, uh, sunseed, uh, maize, um, and they don't care about rural development. Uh, formally, they uh, can support some uh, local programs, but just to make uh, uh, a good uh, impression on local citizens, but, but in fact, uh, they usually don't create a place to work for local people. Um, they just overexploit the local resources and uh, their influence on rural development is not comparable with uh, mentioned above small farms where people um, which live in this area work uh, exactly in this area, but large uh, holdings often even don't pay uh, taxes in this area because they are registered somewhere in other uh, cities in the center. Um, so, um, uh, Victor, uh, while you add uh, this question by Professor Andrzej Kawasiewicz, he has also complimented it with how many such small farms do you have? If you could just add this before going to the next question. Uh, <clears throat> practically, there are two groups uh, in, in so-called small farms. Uh, first group is uh, so-called official small farms, and we mean uh, officially registered uh, farms. And uh, the number of such farms is about maybe uh, 30 thousands of units. Uh, and another sector is uh, larger. It's practically uh, all rural households, which uh, uh, are owner of uh, land plots uh, and use them for agriculture. And uh, the number is uh, um, more, than, more than 10 millions uh, of units in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, um, the actual number is uh, higher, but uh, not all of them are really oriented on uh, agricultural production, uh, but uh, most of them, yes. Uh, Okay, the next question is from Marco Datz. Uh, I'm sorry for not indicating uh, your scientific degree here, but uh, I, I was not aware. Uh, so the question stands, how do you assess the 2027 state regional development strategy goals and tasks targeting the rural areas as a specific functional territory? Um, I'm not sure that uh, uh, this question is for me because uh, This question was uh, written when the next presenter was. Uh, uh, dear Marco Dats, could, could, could you reflect on this then? Yes, it's possible because it was uh, stated to everyone, but I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Dats is, is present or not. So. I think it's a Polish issue. It's possible. Issue, no? Okay, it's possible. It's possible because it was directed to everyone. Uh, okay, uh, the next uh, question, I believe, was directed to you then from Professor Paweł Chmieliński. Mm -hmm. What was behind the decision to start the process that brought to decentralization in Ukraine and what are expectation? expectations about how that process will influence the inclusiveness of rural general growth? Is it about better planning, distribution of funds, or what else? Officially, uh, this uh, reform was focused uh, on um, 
to form efficient local governments and uh, territorial organization of power for better uh, planning, distribution of funds, and uh, uh, creating uh, better living conditions, etc., etc. In fact, uh, the idea behind this is, is uh, that local bodies should be responsible uh, for their communities because uh, uh, before this reform, um, many important powers uh, to uh, make a decision concerning local development uh, was made uh, at the national level or at the regional level and um, local communities uh, had very uh, not significant influence on this. And just now uh, local communities get resources and get a power to decide how to use it and just uh, should report to the central government for the legality of their work and it's all. And they should be responsible. It's the main idea of this uh, process. Okay, and this final question, because uh, Mar Mr. Marco Dats uh, confirmed that uh, the question about the state regional development strategy uh, was actually directed to you, uh, since you mentioned on your last slide that there is a poor national strategy uh, on rural areas. Okay. So basically, I understand the question is if the new strategy targeting 2027 uh, is better in terms of goals and tasks. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the main point here is uh, how this strategy could be implemented uh, in case of Ukraine. I mean, uh, the ideas uh, uh, which is in the core of the strategy could be implemented in Ukraine because uh, our practice shows that uh, during the last uh, 20 years we had many uh, strategies and uh, very often uh, the government changed and uh, starting to prepare a new strategy. And uh, for this, uh, I think uh, the main role and responsibility for the rural development should be um, on local bodies because they understand local needs. They can develop uh, local strategies and <clears throat> uh, should be responsible for, for the people of this community. Uh, it could work. Because in other case, uh, yeah, and uh, the government should just create a good uh, condition and uh, to provide some support. Uh, I, I, I think I think the, the, what what you're saying right now is is true and also supported by uh, Professor Andrzej Hawashevich, who just wrote in the chat that the problem is with implementation of different strategies. So the the I think the issue of implementation planning is one thing, but uh, achieving these goals stated in the strategies has always been uh, the weak point of uh, Ukrainian planning. Uh, whoever was involved in, in these researches understand these implications uh, as it's possible to plan quite a lot of indicators, uh, but uh, the feasibility of their achievement is often uh, threatened by either change of political uh, parties or just lack of financing uh, some crisis and so on. But, uh, if, if uh, you have concluded uh, your answers, so we might uh, then go to the next question. Uh, the, the next question was from uh, Professor Andrzej Hawashevich to uh, Łukasz Komorowski, uh, and uh, it states uh, uh, that the urbanization uh, in, presented uh, uh, during the uh, 
rural development monitoring tool uh, was a desirable direction of development. So is it so? Could you, Wukash, comment on this? Uh, yes, I will try. Uh, thank you for this uh, question. I think I was unclear during my presentation. And in fact, I do not believe that uh, urbanization is the direction we should uh, take because as we know, it causes uh, a number of problems, mainly um, environmental, infrastructural, social, but those problems uh, affect not only those area of urbanization, but uh, wider region. So, a lot of research shows that urbanization reaching farther and farther uh, into regions and draining the periphery. So, uh, no, I, I didn't mean uh, in my presentation, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, those areas of uh, urban sprawl often have nothing in common with the countryside. But the problem is that the admin administrative, administrative criterion but them equal with villages for, from far cities. For example, a uh, village uh, near Warsaw or Poznan is the same administrative uh, status uh, like a uh, small village uh, in Podlaskie region. And this is problem, uh, but uh, not to solve uh, at the... Um, academic uh, level. Um, I believe that uh, solutions uh, for the problem can be more balanced management of rural development. And uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, um, we know that economically multifunctional areas with both well-developed agricultural and non-agricultural sectors, such as Wielkopolskie region, uh, this is opportunity to revitalize rural areas. Um, what more? I think policies should look for uh, solutions that balance uh, this problem of uh, big urbanization in one side and uh, uh, from second side uh, supporting agriculture without development of other economic sectors uh, in some regions. And uh, maybe I'll try to answer second question about, uh, do you know any, for all speakers, do you know any interesting examples of innovative solutions in the smart villages trend and uh, attempt to face the challenges of rural areas that you presented? And I know Dr. Andrzej Hałasiewicz deals with the smart village concept. And uh, in this regard, I would like to recommend a new book about smart village co-authored by Professor Sławomir Kalinowski, Dr. Anna Rosa and uh, me. And in this book, we describe some solutions and the mechanism of their success in Poland in infrastructure, technology, social, agriculture, environment, uh, and so on, but I think the solutions are implemented in micro scale, so it is difficult to find or recommend uh, one catalog of projects ready to use uh, in every every place uh, in uh, some country. Uh, I think I provide the link. Uh, it's Polish version, version, but we hope to have. English one uh, by the end of this uh, year. I think it's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I see Professor Hawashevich also thanks you for the clarification on the first uh, uh, question. Also adding a comment that it seems the solution would be to shift from urban rural dichotomy to locality and local development. So I guess this is an additional comment uh, to ponder upon. And if I may uh, turn to another question that was directed to uh, Monica Tudor uh, by Katarina Kubinakova. And it states, have you considered support from ESF into rural areas in respect of training, building capacity, job creation, et cetera? Would the presentation be available after the conference? Monica? Um, yeah, uh, we do, we look only on the rural development program, not on the uh, social funds 
uh, allocation in Romania and distribution, but uh, uh, of the records. In Romania, the implementation of uh, social funds uh, and rural development uh, could uh, not compete each other. Uh, it's of the record. Uh, it's in the perception of the rural regional regional development agencies because we have eight regional development agencies, uh, and uh, the social funds somehow is uh, it's. Uh, uh, distributed through this this agency and through the national program, uh, they are more uh, in, inclined and their willingness is to to finance more the projects that addressing more urban areas and leave the rural areas and people to be financed through the rural development program. So it's a little bit of switch, but this is a, a, at the level of the perception. Uh, when we're discussing with those with the people that implemented this this type of project, we see that uh, they have this this type of attitude. That not that not means that for the project in the social funds are not accepted the people that work in, that live in rural area for the training and also. But this is the perception actually. Uh, we, we do not see um, this type of project implemented in the uh, uh, small rural communities. Those projects are implemented in the urban area and uh, uh, they uh, 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 trainers and all the people who want that, uh, the, the beneficiary to come in the urban area and to be trained and after that to go back in the rural area. Uh, it's a problem related to the um, uh, structure of the social funds related to the uh, training modules uh, and uh, the particular, uh, let's say, uh, uh, skills that are developed. Because uh, generally speaking, um, the, uh, the people that organize those type of, uh, of training uh, uh, activities look on the uh, needs uh, of the um, of the skills for the industry that is located in urban area, and uh, for the rural areas, the uh, skills needs for the rural uh, business. It's a job for the rural development program, not for the social fund and uh, human capital. So it, uh, it, it this is. Uh, uh, it, this is my perception actually related to uh, when and uh, is created in discussion with those people that are working in the, this program. It's not about an, uh, study and figures. Uh, but the answer, the short answer is not. We do not uh, look on the social funds uh, investment, only on the rural development uh, program uh, in Romania. Uh, related to the availability of the presentation, I think that it's possible to be available after the, this, but uh, I will. I need to discuss with the organizer of the conference to see how they intend to, to proceed with the presentation. Uh, to well, will be uh, available on the website of ERDN of the institute. Mm -hmm. So they they will clarify this uh, this aspect. Of course. Of course. Thank you very much for this answer. Uh, now, just to uh, rem remind everyone that Professor Khalashevich was uh, directing this question uh, already answered by Ukash, but also to all other speakers. So maybe you have any interesting examples of innovative solutions in the smart villages trend that are an attempt to face the challenges of rural areas uh, that were presented. If anyone could reflect on this, it would be great. But if not, we thank very much Lukash for already contributing uh, here. And uh, uh, of course, there are also uh, still some things left to discuss. So we'll be able to do this at future opportunities. And Vitaly, the final... Vitaly, yes. just a second. Uh, actually, the, the professor Andres wants to know about the, this uh, idea and solutions, innovative solutions, uh, for what reason? 
they they want to to build uh, on, uh, let's say uh, on database with this type of studies uh, and uh, examples uh, or because actually we could find in i think that in, uh, in all countries we could find some solutions and uh, uh, smart villages initiatives uh, actually we have we have some initiatives in romania uh, but uh, we need to know uh, if uh, they intend to to build a database or something like that and you know which is the level of the uh, uh, information that uh, is necessary for uh, this type of uh, for, for answering to this type of question. Okay. Uh, Professor Hawashevich, would you like to reflect thank on you. this? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and in fact, uh, my intention was uh, to, to hear some, let's say, positive examples that we are not only complaining that in the rural area the situation is so bad, but maybe <laughs> there, is, there is some light on the end of the tunnel. So I'm not on the stage to, to collect in the systematic way any, any kind of information, but simply to, to, to see what's going on, because in fact, really, uh, new technologies are, are giving a new chance to reality because new technologies allowed to, 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 to solve the problem of the distance in, in many places. But of course, you need a, a good in infrastructure. So uh, from my perspective, really, I see something like a new chance for the new uh, rurality. And in this context was my question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I could confirm that we have some example in Romania, actually, but uh, the initiative was built bottom up. So, so from the, from the people that are active, are involved, and uh, uh, in those initiative uh, was uh, uh, involved some uh, NGOs that try to uh, to put the community together and uh, to uh, to make to stay on the same table and to discuss related to their needs and uh, to find their own solution for rural development. Uh, but uh, I could say to you that uh, uh, if uh, I just uh, uh, refer to uh, one NGO, ADEPT uh, Foundation, that work in Transylvania, uh, they do not apply for, the, for funding uh, in the Romanian rural development program because they do not find a good, um, let's say, uh, direction and uh, measures in the rural development program to cover their needs. So they go uh, into, uh, uh, and find money uh, from the Nor Norway funds, uh, from uh, uh, UK funds, or something like that. They apply in, in other, uh, other found sources, not in the rural development program, because it was not tailored for their needs. But we have some some uh, some uh, initiative, uh, and the the main idea is those initiatives are bottom up started, and uh, they try to, to find their uh, own way to go in the right direction that uh, is inclusive and uh, it's uh, reflecting their and cover their needs. Okay, thank you. <laughs> if if I may. Just a final question because we're really uh, already uh, over uh, our planned time. Uh, but just last question to our Lithuanian uh, colleagues, uh, precisely to get, uh, Dr. Gedminaite Raudone. Uh, as I was just interested to know uh, the opportunities by the Green Deal that you've presented in one of the slides, how do stakeholders understand them? Have you done in depth? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because very often uh, the stakeholders perceive the Green Deal as uh, a restriction, as something that uh, uh, could uh, impose some limitations on their work. But in your presentation, it was the other way around, the opportunities uh, brought by the Green Deal. Could you just uh, elaborate very shortly, shortly uh, on what would those be? Okay, thank you for the for the question. So I would like to answer how we go for the with the Green Deal in Lithuania. And I will talk about the perspective from the different stakeholders, how they see. So in Lithuania, as a Green Deal, we, we see two strategies. First strategy is going and to be more circular. So this means circular eco economy approaches. And this uh, strategy is more for the 
businesses and for the farmers what, how they should follow in their activities. And another is um, uh, using principles of bioeconomy to use more bio resources because you know we have a lot of resources that we can follow. In general, what we mean, um, you know, what the opportunities of the Green Deal that we have the principles to be more local to consume local food, to, to, uh, to do less traveling, not only by persons, but on, in case of the food. So this means more opportunities for local food, yes, to live more healthy, to be more, to use a, a specialization strategy, to define what the strategy you will follow. And of course, to be more, um, environmental friendly. So what this means, this is opportunities for the uh, NGOs, for the consumers on, and for the farmers and businesses itself. Uh, NGOs and consumers are happy because they will have more friendly environment and they will have more local food and more you know, networks and chains, including this. The farmers, small farmers also will benefit because you know, they can use this opportunity. And uh, being uh, green, it means opens new opportunities for the tourism itself, for the internal market and internal market the same. And uh, maybe more who were more cautious on this, the largest farms who should understand that being green maybe means uh, more you know, expenses, but on the other side, we are talking in Lithuania that you should understand that you cannot pollute a lot. We need to take care on environment and we are working with the educating these kind of people. And of course, in some rural development program, we have some measures who can help to adapt these big businesses and farms, you know, for some measures. So somehow this is the stream how we're going uh, with the being more green or adapt green deal in Lithuania. It's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in my opinion, it's very important to see this uh, positive impact uh, of these strategies and uh, w uh, the changes, because very often uh, by the stakeholders, especially uh, the changes are perceived negatively as something uncertain and uh, rather something that would change, uh, how, that would impact uh, the need for change in their uh, activities. Uh, thus, uh, of course, it always creates some kind of uh, uh, ne negative um, uh, understanding. So it's great that this uh, building up this capacity and knowledge uh, transfer actually uh, sets it to a positive path. So this way, uh, implementation of these measures uh, are more feasible, in my opinion, and uh, would be uh, perceived as, as some, something good for, for, for the society. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and uh, presenting uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, it, uh, it's visible that you work hard on this and um, your input is very valued. Uh, overall, it's clear that uh, in all our countries that were presented today, we all have similar prob problems, but uh, the stage of uh, their solution differs, uh, and it's sometimes uh, uh, very uh, overwhelming to see, understand that there have been already 30 years of uh, transformations undergoing in our countries. Uh, and today we had presented, uh, represented three European Union countries, two non-EU countries, but uh, most likely on the path uh, to joining the, the, the big European family. Nevertheless, uh, all our, these issues of inclusive rural development, of uh, uh, creating equal chance, chances and uh, uh, removing the discrimination, either economic or social, uh, is something that we all have to work on. And uh, so thank you again for your input into this work. And uh, we invite you to the future conferences and seminars organized by our institute, as well as by the European Rural Development Network. Thank you very much again and have a good day.